Hello everyone, my name is Philip Fisher. I'm Senior Development Officer in the Alumni and Development Team at the University of Bradford. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this Meet the Alumni event with Ian Adams, Social Inclusion and Equalities Advocate. I'm also delighted that we're joined by Dr. Jo Jack Lopez, Assistant Professor in the School of Social Sciences to host this event. You can also see on this slide that myself and my colleague Holly will be the team behind the scenes on this event far less important than our guest and host, so no photos of ourselves. Before we get started, I wanted to share a few housekeeping points for this event. The event will last for roughly one and a half hours. The first 40 minutes of that we'll be hearing from Ian in conversation with our host. We'll then turn to an audience Q&A with questions submitted by you, our audience, for roughly 20 minutes. You're able to turn on automatic live captions for this event you can do this by clicking on the setting buttons, the image of the cog you'll find on your screen. You can submit questions through the event via the Q&A function and, and please do so. We'll aim to get through as many as we can. If you see a question that you'd like submitted by somebody else, then please click on the thumbs up button to let our host Jack know that you would really like this question to be asked. Myself and my colleague Holly will be monitoring the chat, uh, monitoring the Q&A, so please feel free to use this if you need our help with anything. On that note, it would be great to see where you're all joining from, so please add your city and country in um, to let us know. Um, this event will be being recorded for anyone who's unable to attend live, so we can share that with everyone who's, who's registered. So please ensure before you put anything in the Q&A that you're comfortable with that being shared in the recording that we'll be sending out afterwards. So with all of that out the way, I'd like to now hand over to Dr Jack Lopez, to get the event started by introducing themselves and our speaker. Thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, Philip. I nearly made the fatal mistake of not unmuting myself there. <laughs> I would have been the first to do it. Um, thanks everyone for attending this afternoon. I think it's a lovely way to finish off our week here on a, on a Friday afternoon and welcome to this special Meet the Illumini event. It's always very special for somebody like an academic to be part of these events because we spend such a precious kind of impactful but short amount of time with our students and um, before they go off into the world to do amazing things so being able to kind of um, meet students even ones that, that that I've never taught is always is always a, um, a, a real joy as well and um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce today's um, guest speaker who is Ian Adams. Ian graduated from the School of Management in 2002 and was awarded a distinction in his Master's in Business Administration. He's enjoyed a very broad career in communications from managing a call centre operations and commercial supply chain relationship for the BBC to national marketing campaigns for Vector and the Pensions Regulator and promoting patient safety in the NHS today. Now, all of this is alongside serving as a charity trustee and a further education college governor. Ian also serves um, as, has also served for 20 years as a councillor at Westminster City Council, where he's held a number of senior roles, including cabinet member for adult services and cabinet member for public protection and licensing. He's a regular speaker on social inclusion and equality. So today, Ian is a director of NHS Resolution, which is the legal arm um, of the health service, vice chair of the Single Homeless Project and a non-executive director of Unite Foundation and the Employers Network for Equality and Inclusion. Ian is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Marketing, a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and a leadership fellow of St George's House Windsor. Now, in 2017 to 18, he served as Lord Mayor of Westminster. Ian was listed as an outstanding LGBT plus role model in 2018 and 2019 and 2020. He was awarded Freedom of the City of London in 2018 for public service. And he's also a registered mentor with the NHS Leadership Academy, the Civil Service um, LGBT plus mentoring scheme and the Government Communication Service. So I, for one, am utterly surprised and delighted that you actually have time to spend with us this afternoon because it appears very much from your biography you are a very, very, very busy person. And um, so um, I'm, I'm really pleased that you've 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 given us some some time to to talk about your life and your experience today, Ian. So without further ado, I'd like 
um, to welcome you this afternoon. Well, Jack, thank you. Very, thank you for your very generous and rounded introduction. Goodness gracious. Um, yes, busy, but fulfilled, I guess, is, is how I'd play that back to you. But like, I'm really, really uh, excited and, and very thrilled to be invited by University of Bradford and obviously to, to speak with you in particular today. Uh, and hopefully we will have a, a conversation uh, to unpack some of what you've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So I'm going to kind of we're just going to spend a bit of time. I've got I've got quite a few questions to to pick through your um, very very busy um, life and, and wealth of experience here. And there's so much to cover and so much that I want to ask you, but I'm trying my very best to not make it sound like an interrogation here. <laughs> what we want to do is just kind of really get the highlights. Um, as if we just start, you know, as you are an alumni of Bradford, can you just tell us a little bit about your time here um, as a student and um, why you chose to come to Bradford to study your, your MBA in, in particular? particular and what kind of period of your your life did you come to study as well were you were you fresh out of um college or was it later in life when you already had some work experience great thank you jack of course i mean just looking back i think you said that i um graduated um in 2002 so 20 years ago goodness gracious <laughs> what, what's happened since um, so I, I think i was i was mid-30s sort of early mid-30s so a mature student coming into the University of Bradford. And it was a real privilege, um, not least because I was um, sponsored through my masters by my then employer, the BBC. And I think fundamentally, the reason why I ended up at Bradford with fellow BBC colleagues on my cohort was we had a corporate arrangement in the north of England. Uh, this predated, interestingly, the, the Salford uh, development and the Salford studios, which we all know. I love, I'm sure, that the BBC and ITV, in fact, have now. But so this, this was a, an attempt and it was a bold and conscious attempt by the corporation to spread some of it, 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 its corporate uh, presence more widely than outside London and the South East. And you know, I think for me, it was very exciting. I, I, I when I gained my first degree uh, from City of London Poly, you know, I, I never thought I'd go back to be a student, um, albeit part time. And I think there is just a trio of benefits of coming to Bradford at the time. One was um, that return to formal, structured and quite stretching study, um, not least you know, at the time I, I was a, one of the highest ranked executive MBA programmes globally run by Bradford. And I'm sure that that remains the case today. I think the other benefits, of course, I continue to work. I continue to, to draw the salary to pay the rent, so to speak. So uh, I was very, very uh, privileged with with being able to do that. Um, and then I think most importantly, there is that platform that gaining my master's from Bradford then provided as if you like a springboard springboard for my future career. Excellent. I think I've just realised as well that as you were talking there, I didn't introduce um, my position <laughs> when I started. Um, and just for, for people who don't know, I'm I'm Associate Dean for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in the Faculty of Management, Law and Social Sciences. So um, I've, I've been in this faculty kind of around about 18 months now and you know, we, it, it's the, the School of Management is, is so successful in terms of where it is as a world leading kind of business school at the moment. And, and it's 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 really lovely to hear that it was just as strong 20 years ago as well. And the steep history there is in, in, in studying um, management and business here in Bradford. So do you have any particular favourite memories of the time that you were studying um, your your masters here, whether they're academic, personal or professional? Yeah, thanks, Jack. I mean, I, I certainly found the the, ex, the study experience truly immersive and, and I really gained from that sort of opportunity to do some deep thinking, deep study and deep inquiry. I mean, it, the, the, the format quite simply was spending uh, single weeks at a time at the School of Management at Heaton Mount. Um, so we'd all, we all shut up on a sort of Sunday evening very excited, a bit nervous, a bit anxious, of course, as well. You know, have a, have a remember the toothbrush, etc. Um, and I, I was among a group of around a dozen BBC colleagues at the time. So I think one of the, the fondest aspects of that is that over time we became, if you like, quite a tight knit 
group, a tight-knit cohort, cohort of friends. And in fact, um, we continue to meet socially for several years afterwards, and I still see one or two of them today, you know, 20 years after we, we passed out. Um, I mean, there's certainly something around the breadth of the curriculum, and you know, one of the joys of studying an MBA or, or something akin to an MBA is, is the breadth through that modular approach. So you'd spend a week at a time doing a deep dive around a particular topic, subject, if you like. And also being exposed to, um, I guess, subjects that I'd never had either the opportunity nor necessarily the inclination to get up close to previously. Uh, my first degree was in politics. So, you know, coming away to Bradford to spend a week doing finance and accounting or marketing or ops management. And in fact, you know, those are three examples of areas that have stayed with me throughout my professional life in terms of deploying elements from what I picked up, you know, 20 odd years ago. Um, and I think also on a personal level, our cohort made, I think, how can I say this, good use of Bradford's famous South Asian uh, cuisine. And I think it was each Tuesday night after we'd settled in for a, a, a few days, we'd, um, we'd head out as a group, sometimes with our Bradford tutor, of course, to sample one of the local curry houses. And I, I think that plus, should we say, the beer consumption made for a slow start the following morning for some of us. So you know, lots of really happy memories, but an absolute real legacy in, in the true sense of the word. Excellent. Yes, there's definitely people are definitely well fed when they come to study in Bradford. And um, so just thinking about kind of leading on for your 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 MBA and a, and a connection to to how your career began to develop as well. Um, can I ask you a little bit about um, how your MBA kind of led on to the the progression in your in your career? Um, did you were you still did you stay with the BBC uh, once you'd completed your masters, or did that then open the door for you to to develop your career elsewhere? Yeah, I, I probably stayed with the BBC for another um, actually another five years in total, and there there was some. Um, career progression development within that time frame. So I think while I was still with the corporation, I was given a number of new commercial management opportunities, which I'd never experienced before, including, as I think you mentioned in your intro, managing a, a customer service satellite distribution contract with Sky TV, who were not natural bedfellows of the BBC. Uh, and later I went on to become head of business development for a BBC spin-off called Digital UK, which was set up by the BBC and other public broadcasters to manage the UK switch to digital TV. So I left the BBC Digital UK in 2007 um, when I was appointed to what I would describe as my first very senior executive director role at BECTA, which stands for the British Education Communications Technology Agency. So quite a mouthful, but in essence, we were a sort of branch of the Department of Education and charged with rolling out ICT technology to all state schools and colleges in England. And that was part of the school's modernization program at the time. So I was exec director for marketing and partnerships at BECTA. And I think it was that role that helped to cement my senior career within the communications field at a national level, something which I continue to do, to do today at the NHS as engagement director for NHS resolution, the NHS's in-house legal department, as you, as you rightly described earlier. And then, you know, I think as well as the, the formal content which I deploy today, you know, a lot of the stuff has enabled me to go on and, and, and continue to um, practice effectively what I picked up, what I learnt in, in Bradford. Um, I mean, just thinking about, you know, how graduating from, from Bradford led on to, to my career progression beyond the BBC and beyond Bechter. I think one of the key things, it, it gave me confidence, um, both academically to, to, to think and apply uh, management concepts and, and frameworks and models, which I still do today, whether it's finance or, or strategy or marketing or what have you, um, and, and confidence to have the conversation with those around me, given that, for example, today, you know, I work with some other highly qualified professionals such as hospital doctors and lawyers mm. in, in my NHS organisation. And, you know, I'm talking here as someone who, you know, I was the first in my family to complete a university degree. So, you know, my Bradford MBA, I think genuinely 
has contributed to my personal social mobility, which I think is a really important point I want to emphasise today. Yeah, I think absolutely. It's it's so true that there's often the things that we don't really talk about in terms of the the, the benefits of um, higher education study and particularly postgraduate study as well. You know, we often talk about, you know, this is your opportunity to change career. This is your opportunity for deep learning. But I think what you said there about how postgraduate study develops one's confidence as well just as you're kind of getting into that stage of adulthood where you want to um, progress more in your career it's those are the kind of things that you know that I see from the classroom perspective as well as as, as being the kind of that they're, they're the secret the secret joys of, 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 of lifelong learning and study as well is that yes it equips you and allows you to walk into a room knowing that you have something to contribute and that's that's really important and I think having having supportive supportive educators and um, courses that you can relate to and that I think this is the other thing as well with postgraduate education is that you choose to study you know you you choose the topic so you're very much invested in it now we are here of course to mainly talk about your work as well and your your efforts in social inclusion and, and equalities advocate and I can see you know from your biography from conversations that we've had how you know a, a passion and an interest for for EDI can come in because you've 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 you're you know in in terms of working in media and marketing but that's taken you into the education environment you're also in politics you know you also are heavily involved in different voluntary roles so I can I can really see where EDI starts to come to the forefront because what you're doing is is looking at, at inequality and injustice uh, on a daily basis so is, is there something you can tell us about how particularly um, you've worked to improve equality through the professional roles in, in your work environments um, to start off with, I think? Yeah, absolutely, Jack. And I'm very conscious and I use this term very deliberately and it may be something that we want to unpack together today, but I use my, my privilege and I'm very conscious of using my privilege, by which I mean my seniority and my profile, some of which you've highlighted a number of times already, both in, in a kind of work setting and, and a, an outside of work setting. Um, I guess having worked in the public sector for around two thirds of my career, I'm used to operating in environments which I would regard as, as very values driven, very values rich, values driven in terms of behaviour, respect. So for example, today, today's NHS resolution, we do place a huge emphasis, if you will, on, on mutual respect and I'm able I think to reflect that in my my advocacy advocacy for equality, diversity and inclusion in the broader sense and also as someone who is recognised as a role model for the LGBTQ plus community. So I guess in practical terms that translates into supporting various staff networks, for example, at NHS Resolution, where I'm the senior sponsor of our LGBTQ plus network and as an ally of other staff networks alongside other directors and, and like today I enjoy sharing my lived experience and advocacy through speaking engagements and and in the news media and on social media so I think that's you know that, that, that's how I'm trying to as you say work to improve EDI through the roles uh, that I undertake and the operating environments that I occupy. Mm. And I think that kind of makes me think about, um, you know, because I've I've been in a senior management role for just over 18 months now. One of the first things that I thought when I came into this role was, um, you know, I've got here. I've got this particular privileges, you know, about myself that have got have got me into the role that I've got, you know, in terms of the length of time in higher education, in terms of my ethnicity, you know, and so forth and, and, and the confidence that I have. Um, my masculinity walking into to roles but I often think about how, this thing about privilege, privilege is really interesting because we can recognize and hold it but how how do you think how do we use it to 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 benefit others you know I often ask myself the questions of you know now I've got where I can what doors can I open for other people um, mm -hmm. and I can see how that works in an education environment in the way that I can encourage people to get involved in projects and put people forward for different things how does that work um, 
in in large, really large kind of juggernaut institutions such as the NHS. Do you think it's possible for you to be able to um, provide a space that allows other people um, space, I suppose? Yeah, to use that word again. Sure, absolutely. I mean, just picking up on on the opening point you were making about, you know, privilege and, um, you know, I'm, I'm also acutely aware of my own personal privileges, privileges as a cis white male uh, you know, who at the same time does stem from a, a, a fairly sort of regular normal working class background. Both my parents left school. Uh, um, I think my mum left school when she was 14 and my dad when he was 16. Wow. You know, so yeah, mm -hmm. precisely. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just to emphasise, I was also privileged in that context. You know, we never went hungry. And we had a roof over our head. Yeah, so it wasn't a dire situation by any means, and a huge amount of love and nurturing within within that 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 family context. Um, but you know, coming back right up to today, I, I am keen to, if you like, expend the currency of the roles and the positions uh, that I occupy. Um, as I said, both both professional roles and outside in the community to help advance and promote and challenge the conversation, the discourse, the dialogue about social mobility, not having at all anything like all the answers. And I think quite often someone in my position ought to be more there to facilitate through inquiry, through through having the questions to, 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 to kind of lubricate the conversation. And I think fundamentally, juggernaut or not, you know, in terms of scale of organisation, I think it's giving those around you uh, not the permission, but the confidence to engage in, in, that, in that dialogue as well whether they uh, ha are, are from a particular, say, protected characteristic or whether uh, from a kind of intersectional point of view, they, they want to know more, they want to find out more, they want to understand more, they want to support more uh, those, those around them. Yeah, I think you're making me think that I think one of the most liberating things and, and ways of engaging in conversations with people is once you are in a, a position of responsibility because I think I'd rather say responsibility than power as well because there's very few of us that actually have any power but it's positions of responsibility um, is that the liberation in ad admitting and having the confidence to admit that you don't have all the answers is 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 a really really it is a powerful way of working with people around equality diversity and inclusion issues most definitely so if you have a look now kind of leaving kind of almost straight coming out of your mba in 2002 this is also when when you took yourself in into politics and the the political side of your career as well so when you did so can you tell us a little bit about what what your motivations were and if you can remember <laughs> if you can remember 20 years ago what what did you want to achieve at that time what was the driving force of you going into politics yeah absolutely I mean you're right it is quite a long while ago um I mean I've always been a bit nerdy my word around organized party politics I, in fact I, I was a member of one of our main political parties the conservative party here in the UK as, as a teenager interestingly so uh, you know I've always been been you know I've always belonged to organised uh, political groups. Um, and as I mentioned, I think earlier on, my first degree, my bachelor's was in politics and government. Um, but I think in absolute truth, <laughs> and I was thinking about this overnight, um, one of the key motivations for seeking election was wanting, if you like, to fill the void that had been created by my impending graduation from Bradford in 2002. So having had this amazingly enriching and, and immersive experience spread out over two plus years coming up to Bradford uh, on a kind of release basis, um, you know, I was getting, I, I was actually thinking, well, how, how, what, what can I do next? Basically, mm -hmm. I need another project <laughs> or another program. So I was extremely, Jack, extremely sort of unprepared and naive about what entering public office as a local councillor was all about. I, I, you know, there's, there's no kind of playbook. I went along to a few uh, sort of meetings at Westminster City Hall where I was standing as a candidate just to kind of soak it up. Um, but of course, and, until you, you know, sign on the dotted line once you, you've been elected that you're going to take, take on board all that comes with being a local councillor, you don't really know what it's about until you do it. It's a, a learning through experience. 
process. I mean, I was fortunate at Westminster that I rose relatively quickly through the ranks and I served as cabinet member for health and social services after I think around three years of being first elected. So I, I did kind of get a taste of both serving as a backbencher, as a frontbencher, and that, that put me in a good position for further developing my career over the 20 years that I was on the council. I think just just me sitting here with my because as an academic, I'm a social and medical anthropologist and just sitting here with my anthropologist head on. I'm just I'm I'm, I'm really jealous in terms of the the, the insight in terms of being a, you know, a participant um, observer in those in, in those areas. It, it, I'd just be absolutely fascinated to be moving around those those social groups and listening to the conversations and seeing how those decisions happen um, and actually understanding when you see the House of Commons on the television, you, you were close enough to, to actually hear what people were whispering about as they were sat next to you. <laughs> So there was a really interesting aspect of your work in local politics was um, was your public protection brief um, and how that related to the LGBTQ plus um, community. Can you tell us a little bit uh, more about what what that involved and also kind of explain to people what a public protection brief is? Yeah, very much, Jack. So I actually held two concurrent jobs at Westminster Council at the time. One was as cabinet member for public protection. Um, but I was also the LGBT lead member and the, the two things very much complemented one another. Um, but my, my public protection brief was fairly wide and I guess principally involved liaison uh, and some joint working with the police on areas such as knife crime, county lines, personal safety. So in essence, what that brief was about was seeking to make Westminster the safest possible place to live work and visit. So that, that in essence was what pu the public protection role was all about. And I must say it wasn't always easy. It was quite a challenging role, actually, um, not least because I was also within that context accountable for uh, street sleeping and homeless people uh, mm. on the streets of Westminster. And you know, we, we, sadly, we have a very high prevalence of that here, uh, given uh, you know, we're in the West End and, and what have you. Um, and having been lobbied as well by members of the local community, to remove rough sleepers from the streets. Now, of course, that would be neither appropriate nor legal, not least because the council, the councils don't have powers like that. Uh, and a lot of our remit is around persuasion uh, and trying to persuade people off the streets into safer settings like hostels and what have you. Um, but some of the work crossed into my other role as the lead member for LGBT issues. So, for example, around one in four, this is quite stark actually, this, this number, around one in four young people aged under 25 who end up on the streets uh, nationally um, self-identify as LGBTQ. Mm. And if you think about it, a lot of them will get, will get basically kicked out of their, their family homes having come out. So they will technically be family estranged young people. Um, and because of that, I introduced specialist training for the council's frontline housing support staff in order to give them the confidence and the understanding to have meaningful and respectful conversations with LGBTQ people presenting as homeless to the council. Yeah. And that was through a partnership we developed with Stonewall Housing. Um, another thing I did, I pioneered a community outreach service called Soho Angels, which involved, I think we trained a good few hundred volunteers, um, both LGBTQ and non-LGBTQ, who were trained by the LGBT Foundation based in Manchester in techniques to engage with visitors to London's West End, in particular Soho, which has a high prevalence of LGBTQ bars and clubs uh, and, and cultural venues as well. And in fact, the scheme was so successful uh, in diverting people away from unnecessary ambulance call outs um, that we won funding, unexpectedly funding, funding from the NHS, which meant that we could extend the service across other nights of the week. And then I guess another example around the public protection role that I was doing, I spearheaded uh, quite a major lobbying campaign uh, around short term lettings, giving, and it's largely reflecting the relatively high level of disturbance. This was obviously pre-pandemic at the time caused to local residents through regular high churn of people staying in Airbnb and similar short term let accommodation. 
Uh, now, the council's policy at the time was not to ban or not, not to want to ban short term letting, but it's about wanting to control the number of nights per year that a flat or a house could be let. Not least because our, our view was it, it was kind of hollowing out local communities, people that perhaps used to live in the house no longer did because it was more lucrative to, to, to let it out through through platforms that I've mentioned. Um, but through that, I got involved in doing a lot of media interviews, writing newspaper articles and contributed to the formation of a parliamentary or party group on short term letting, which I was really proud of as a, as a, as a legacy and that, that work continues today locally here. Yeah, it's really it, it's really fascinating to see how kind of how almost it, it's you know it's always difficult to talk about life in a linear fashion but mm. it's as as your what your narrative does and 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 what you're describing to me is is very much an, a kind of almost serendipitous step by step process of how your 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 life hasn't necessarily you know you don't sit there and I think this is really important for for maybe younger people to hear as well that you don't sit there with a plan of going from A, B, C, D and this is how I'm going to get there but actually how a lot of this life experience a lot of the really important work you've done has kind of naturally unfolded from the different kind of um, positions that you've had and opportunities that that then come along. Um, I've just I had no idea that you that, that you had angels in uh, in around Soho as well because I'm very familiar. When as soon as you said that, I thought about the LGBT Foundation because we have the the Manchester Angels as well. So I was just wondering, going, oh, which came first? Because I know that that they're still around there. Um, and I, you know, it's it almost saddens me to 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 know about that statistic about one in four. Um, queer youth as well um, on the streets and suffering homelessness because I was you know my, my one of my first careers was as a social worker and a community worker and I was uh, mainly worked with with young people from 16 to 25. Um, I worked with a lot of homeless um, young people in Manchester on the streets and you know this was one of the biggest issues that we dealt with in Manchester then as well was the amount of queer youth on the streets um, and it's it, it's just so sad to know that you know just still a few years ago we're, we're still in this situation where so many young people are are left homeless um you know which in turn you know is isn't just the fact that they don't have a roof over their head their education is impacted their welfare their health their their trauma throughout their life um goes on there and it's 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 yeah it's it's, it's you know as uh, as a queer person myself as well it's just a it makes me feel how lucky I've been to always have been supported by my family and also quite sad that we're we're still having to face these issues today. Um, so kind of in around about 2018, um, this for me is, is, is a really impressive fact about your life as well. You had the opportunity to serve as the Lord Mayor of Westminster mm -hmm. and you got to wear the bling and you got to wear the, the, the excellent um, regalia that we saw on the powerpoints um uh, at the front which i'm sure is clearly the best part of the job <laughs> <laughs> but how important was it to you personally to be to be visible um as an lgbtq plus um person in a very straight world representing a, a position of, of power you know there's there's so much kind of um cis heteronormativity around the these roles in politics so so what 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 was it like being visible as, as a gay man in that in that position yeah thank you jack i mean it was fascinating on all sorts of levels i mean um other than but including the bling as you, as you put it earlier um i mean so in effect um or, or as a matter of fact i was the first openly gay holder of that of that office and it's an interesting uh, civic role um, and cities and towns across uh, throughout the country and elsewhere will have will have an equivalent role um, but for me you know I, I did get to kind of rub shoulders t technically and 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 uh, sometimes uh, more, more so with all sorts of so-called great and good and I, I I think at the start of my term as I was preparing to to take up the mantle as the Lord Mayor Westminster, I didn't really consider myself as a role model in a way that, in fact, I, I developed into during my year in office. Um, 
And I think what was going on around me is I was hearing and seeing the positive impact that I and Christopher, who's my husband, um, who served alongside me, clearly very visibly as my same sex consort. Um, you know, I think that that, that that in itself, you know, was, was an, un, you know, an un, often an unsaid, but a highly visible signal of intent, you know, whether it was, um, you know, without being indiscreet, but being introduced to very, very senior members of the royal family together, whether it was meeting uh, senior uh, diplomats uh, from overseas countries based in Westminster, um, or from my point of view, whether it was, you know, representing the LGBT community in particular events. I, I think I was the first little man to head up the London Pride event that year in 2017. That was a great honour. I mean, there is, there is an amusing story which I, I'd love to tell, which was um, we, we did a lot of events at Westminster Abbey because the holder of the Lord Meralty also uh, is the holder of, a, of an honorary position during the, the year, which is a de the deputy high steward of Westminster Abbey. It goes back to Elizabethan times, fascinating bit of history. Um, and, uh, you know, so you spend a lot of your time during your year as the Lord Mayor of Westminster doing stuff at Westminster Abbey. And inevitably you get to know people from the Dean downwards very, very well. Very, you know, you, you, you're often uh, eating, drinking and, and uh, worshipping with, with those, those colleagues in different ways. And I remember there was one occasion when the then Dean of Westminster, John Hall, he was keen to introduce both me and Christopher, uh, my consort, to the Archbishop of Canterbury, who'd been there because he, he delivered a sermon at, at a particular service during the year. And it was a service for Commonwealth heads of government, which was interesting, given what we heard last night on, on the opening ceremony of the Games, so how many Commonwealth countries do not uh, condone or have not legalised same-sex relationships. Interesting mm -hmm. context. But John Hall, the Dean, was very keen to shine a light on the positive impact that, that mine and Chris's presence had had among the Abbey community and congregation during our, our term of office. And he was keen to basically give the Archbishop an opportunity to, to hear that and to see it for himself. So I, I guess the punchline, Jack, forgive me, is that I can now say publicly that I was outed to the Archbishop of Canterbury by the Dean of Westminster Abbey. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but more seriously, you know, I, I think something that re really does stick in the mind was meeting um, you know, younger members of the LGBTQ plus community when I was the Lord Mayor and being told by them how much in, in their eyes I was seen as a role model, um, something which I hadn't really fully considered, uh, but it was feedback, feedback like that that wanted me to use the platform, the position very consciously and we, we curated aspects of that during the year, not least through the media and through stakeholder outreach to promote inclusion and wider understanding on behalf of the LGBTQ plus community. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's it, it, it's so important, this idea of visibility, the, the notion of, of representation. And I think a lot of people feel that, you know, if they're if if they're given the title role model that they suddenly feel that they they need to be 100 percent perfect and that they must be doing something but on a day to day basis, you know, as impactful as Spider-Man or Superman and, you know, and actually that being a role model is so much about just being there and being visible and being somebody that young people can can see you know, to know. And I think especially, you know, this, this this happens in other communities, but specifically within the LGBTQ plus community as well. There's so much of a, you know, unfortunately, of a shortening of life of, of queer people for various different things um, that for young people to be able to see just the ba bare basic that there is a future for them, that they can grow up into adults and that they can do amazing and interesting things and they can be happy and they can love and have relationships is, you know, that that you don't even necessarily need to be doing anything. You just need to be there to be seen 
and where you can. And that that also this this question about visibility really makes me think about how how our visibility as as queer people has changed over the years and how how we're able to be a lot more visible than we used to be um but but it also makes me question about the the type of person that gets mm -hmm. a platform the type of person that can be visible and this comes to you know something a question that was posed to me once when you know i do a lot of public speaking a lot of training and and and, and i'm very very visible about my identity but somebody once posed the question to me you know whenever you have a platform platform and people are listening to you question yourself as a queer person what is it about you that is making you receptive you know to to non-queer audiences um for, for for what is there something particular about how you look or how you perform or, or how you relate to people that makes you almost you know i hesitate to use the word but palatable to to the straight world um and um i think when I, when I think about the way things have changed in, in, in politics as well, you know, it reminds me very much of uh, of the, the former mayor of Bangor in Wales, Owen Hercombe, who was the youngest person in history to take his position. They are very vibrantly dressed with luminous green hair, very openly queer. They're out campaigning and being very political. Um, but but yet they, they too are still a kind of anomaly in, in queer representation in politics. I think we've only got to look at um, who is really out within our in the government or or any of the political parties and how they present themselves. So we're often asked this question in EDI, you know, and I think it originally I think it even might come from Stonewall is, you know, the the, the goal of, of, of inclusion in the workplace is everybody being able to feel that they can 100% bring themselves to the workplace, that you're not hiding any part of that. Do you do you have you had that experience kind of over the years and over the last couple of decades where previously you felt you 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 may have had to have hide certain aspects of yourself that that now you don't have that pressure to do do you, have you sensed a change in in how you're able to be visible as a gay man for example i guess personally speaking jack the, the simple answer is i've always been out throughout my whole career um, both, both professionally and in my, my political career as well. Now, that could be a reflection, for example, on the sort of roles that I was undertaking, the sort of organisations that I was working for, the cultures mm. that I mentioned earlier on, vis-a-vis -vis working primarily, not exclusively though, but primarily for public sector organisations. But e even when I spent you know, five years working for, for a, a national retail chain in uh, HQ, you know, I was very comfortably out and, be, and being, you know, who, who I was at the time. And that was, uh, you know, when I'm saying this to you and the audience today, I absolutely am the first to recognise that not everyone will have the same experience as me. And you mentioned Stonewall, and I think Stonewall quote around 26 percent, one in four graduates, they go back into the closet once they've uh, you know, once they have finished at uni and enter the world of work. In my mind, really important point, I think that more reflects very poorly on those employers whose companies and brands cause that to happen. So it, 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 the, the trigger is not the young people themselves necessarily, but it's the working environment, the working culture uh, that is created and fostered and not challenged sufficiently to mean that some young people don't feel confident to, as you said before, bring their host, home, whole selves into the workplace. And I think, you know, going back to where I fit in, going back to your original question, I guess being honest, I've had a lot of positive feedback from non-LGBTQ people, some of whom just want to have a sort of word in my ear. They want to have a private conversation. They've got something on their mind that they don't quite understand, they don't get. Um, I remember I, I had a conversation uh, with a senior, in fact, he was a chief executive of an organisation that I, I was involved with a while ago. And he, he had a, a genuinely, to him, really important question about the rainbow colours and other symbols on his lanyard during mm -hmm. Pride Month. And he, he, and, and he wanted to know um, whether he ought to add additional, should we say, embellishments to that um, around particular uh, protected characteristics and 
you know, he wasn't going to raise that in, in an open forum, uh, I don't think. But you know, he was able to come to me in confidence, knowing who I was. So I guess in a way, it's a bit of a two way street. Um, but I guess I see the question through the lens, if you like, of social inclusion. And I hope that by sharing my lived experience with those who are not part of the LGBTQ plus community, that I'm kind of helping to foster greater mutual understanding and respect. And, you know, as I said earlier on, I don't have all the answers, but I'm a strong advocate for encouraging engagement and building connections and networks and getting different people around the, the, the metaphorical or actual table. Mm -hmm. So I guess one of my roles uh, with, with my LGBTQ hat on is, is being a connector, a social connector. Yeah, and I think you know it's it, it's also this this notion of belonging is really important because it it also makes me think that that also you know we as queer people also need to be engaging with people or, or any different intersections of our identities. You know, we 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 need to be understanding other people's lives as well, um, and you know we need we need to be understanding regardless of you know what what characteristics or or connections of you know mix of of identities that a person has as well so yeah it's it's also i think you know not always about other people really needing to understand us but it's about us having to understand each other really isn't it to find that to find that common ground where it's not about everybody thinking feeling the same and having the same opinions but actually it's about the mutual respect mm -hmm that essentially we're all human beings at, at the end of the day and that, that there's a, a certain level as long as we're not harming each other that we need to respect each other. So after ending your, your time in local politics, you, you've continued and expanded your work in a range of voluntary roles in different organisations. Um, could you introduce those organisations to us and, and why you feel that your, your work with each of them is, is important? Yeah, so I decided around one year ago to stand down from Westminster Council at the last local elections, which happened in May of this year. And that, that really marked the 20th anniversary of being on the council. And during that time, over the last 12 months, I've joined a number of charity boards as a volunteer trustee, some of which you mentioned early on. And I think the connection between all of my charity roles is, is that social inclusion piece. Hence, for example, today I serve as the vice chair of a London homeless charity. I sit on the board of another charity which places young people who are family estranged or care leavers and placing those people into university. So, you know, that, that, to me, that, that is around big time social inclusion and that does knit together a, a lot of my passion, a lot of my interest again, building on the work that I was doing as a councillor over the last two decades. Mm. And this, um, you mentioned there, and this is um, where the, the organisation that you work with in terms of supporting care leavers to go into university is something that really interests me because in my role, you know, part of the, the EDI strategies and, and things that I need to look at of people who are traditionally excluded from higher education, we very much talk about care leavers um, but unfortunately, I think a lot of the time it's still an afterthought as well when we're looking at the picture of, of who gets into higher education and something, um, a conversation that, that, that we have in, in our faculty as well over the last few years is, is also the level of academics who are also care leavers and there's very little attention on, on people who've advanced and, and their visibility to people. What do you think, kind of, I'm, I'm being sneaky and adding in an additional question here, but it, just because it, 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 it's, it's something I want to know more about about um, you know we know that there are lifelong challenges for education in terms of for, for young people in the care system you know because of everything else that's gone on in their lives it will have been difficult for them to engage in school and college and so forth but can you tell us a little bit more about what are the extra additional challenges that we might not think about for a care leaver in higher education yeah thanks jack for that absolutely so the organization in question is called unite foundation uh, now, we don't currently, unfortunately, have a relationship with Bradford, but we operate um, through 26 universities across England and Scotland. And we're, we're effectively, we're the charitable foundation of Unite Student Housing. And every year they, they, they invest around a million pounds um, from their very lucrative business model, I must say, into putting around 100 uh, 
people through university by providing a free room, free accommodation, and ever increasingly, given the current cost of living crisis, uh, we pay for their utility bills, their electricity and, and heating, etc. Um, and we've just published an impact report looking at what you know, what, what difference does Unite Foundation? Why is it important? Which I think is your, your question. Mm -hmm. First of all, there is the, there is the vis visibility piece. You know, in some regards, I think there's a direct correlation parallel with uh, my uh, visibility to gain man, which may not be apparent. And it may be that something that I have to you know, spend time coming out, which I don't mind at all, but, you know, be, being who I am, that does then put that into, into proper rounded context. And, and I think you know, for a lot of care leaders, you mentioned you have some of your academic colleagues, it may not be apparent when you're meeting with them that they, they are former former care leaders. Um, I mean, a lot of these people, when they're in their formative teenage years, 15, 16, are, are, are told, they're told that, oh, you know, you, you, you'll you never be good enough to go to university. You know, given your background, you've, you've been family hopping, under the aegis of the local authority, et cetera, et cetera. You know, university is not for you, to paraphrase. And in fact, we, we had a, a recent 10th anniversary event to celebrate the Unite Foundation's success over the, the last 10 years. And some uh, of our own alumni, uh, who are in our sort of mid twenties, getting on well with their own careers, were explaining what it was like for them as, as young people, being told that they, they, they could not go to university. There was one young person who gave a very stark and I thought personally sad story where she had to choose between her family or higher education. She chose the latter and became therefore estranged from her from her family. And that wasn't done with her, um, her sexual orientation identity, it was, it was to do with family culture. So mm -hmm. th these things are uh, often multifactorial, very complex. I mean, the, la the last point just to, to reflect on is an independent impact assessment mm -hmm. and we managed to get evidence which is that if you're a young person with the, a, a care leaver or family estranged young person coming into university with the support that Unite Foundation provides to you, you will effectively uh, endure on your program on your, um, just as much as you would if you were from, from a, a, a a uh, uh, regular family background, if you like, and also you, you will gain just as high as well. Whereas sadly, sadly, going back to the visibility point, Jack, that you mentioned, if you, you aren't getting the support from those around you, uh, whether you're not foundation or from the HEI in question, uh, and you do come from a curly background, you're high, more likely to leave uh, early mm -hmm. through your mid, mid, mid course, um, and or not get as high as high a grade. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of, lot of you know, stuff that I'm just skirting over here. And I think fundamentally, this is a, you know, taking something uh, away from you as somebody who had a really challenging upbringing, by and large, mm -hmm. you know, one thing you don't have to worry about is having a roof over your head or pencils. Get on and study and, uh, you know, really make most of your enriching experience at university. Yeah, yeah, it's really important to think about that because it's it's just that it's that fine balance, isn't it, between um, you know money can't solve everything, but it it really helps <laughs> the fact that if somebody has got a clean, warm place to return to at the end of their day, where their bills are paid, um, there is food in the cupboard, it just takes away that stress for them to be able to, to go elsewhere. But yeah, it really resonates what you were saying to me there, Ian, because quite often over the years, um, you know, as as a as a as a lecturer when I've been um kind of dealing with students who are just about to have to to withdraw from their programmes or or leave, it's very often facets about their identity, such as them being a care leaver, um, that don't arise until they're literally out walking out the door. 
um, mm. by, by which point often sometimes it can be too late or sometimes you can then get the support in place for them depending um, where they're at but it's really difficult and a, a lot of that you know as, as you'll know yourself as well is also about battling the stigma of, of being somebody from a care um, leaving background or from a low socioeconomic background or from an LGBTQ um, background it's it's really about battling those two things that we don't have to force everybody to carry their identities and their issues around them on a badge all the time but we do need to do something about the stigma um, around excluded people so so that you know there's a middle ground there and they're able to declare to the people that they they know about that as well um, so just kind of finishing off here before we go on to, I think you're right Jack and, and I was gonna say I think you're right and I think the key thing in my mind is um, putting in place systems and processes, which means that young people don't have to keep telling the story, as you say, which is a, a, a build on what you were saying around, you know, you, you don't have to wear the metaphorical badge as you were describing. But you know, if, if a university can capture at the right point, preferably during the, the pre-admission process, uh, the, the full story of that particular individual and make sure that that, that is treated confidentially, but is, is shared appropriately, it means the individual doesn't have to keep repeating the same narrative over yeah. and over again. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah, it's so important. So just as we we kind of we, we've talked a lot, so I've got one more question to ask you before we have a look at, at the Q&A and any audience questions and really just rounding off, you know, we we are we're in a bit of a tough world at the minute. I mean, there's always stuff going on, but it, it's you know, I don't know about you, but it, in, in many aspects, it, it feels particularly um, tough at the minute. I think we're, we have the novel experience of, um, you know, having survived through a couple of years of a, of a humongous, you know, global health pandemic and, and so forth and, and everything else that's gone on. You know, we, we talk about the, the, the phrase that the, the cost of living crisis is being bounded around a lot. But what that essentially means is, you know, families cannot afford to feed their children. People are being made homeless. Um, there's, 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 it's, it's, it's quite desperate, really, when you think of how we are as a high income country country we're, we're suffering there and this has impacts on homelessness access to public health our treatment of asylum seekers victims of human trafficking and and you know recent government proposals of what they wanted to do um around that and changes you know the 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 imminent changes that the the, the current government wants to make to equality and human rights legislation as well post brexit for you kind of it's it is difficult to put this in a nutshell but but what do you see as the biggest challenge challenges facing us today, particularly around social inclusion? I mean, I think you're right. There are many challenges, you know, multifactorial, multi-layered and complex. And sadly, and I, I concur with all of what you said in your question there, Jack, they're, they're getting more potent and more challenging. Uh, absolutely. When you particularly when you look at the geopolitical uh, stuff that's happening globally as well. Um, and I think from a UK perspective, I'd certainly highlight the cost of living crisis as a potential driver for worsening social inclusion over the medium term. I mean, you know, we, we see, as you were hinting and suggesting, a you know, higher prevalence of food banks, for example, being an indicator, you know, an extrinsic indicator of, of, of increased poverty in our society. Um, you know, I'm also thinking of reduced opportunities that we're seeing, sadly, uh, to study or progress one's career due to the worsening economic situation. Um, and I think there's a serious risk that employers will reduce opportunities for, say, paid uh, work placement opportunities as a prelude to getting on the rung to paid employment. We've seen it, for instance, haven't we, in the civil service of late with the, the suspension this year of the graduate training scheme. Bad decision, bad decision. Um, and then another concern I have, and we touched upon this earlier, I think, is the potential negative impact arising in my mind, from social media through a kind of lack of proper dialogue and understanding and space to create that that proper dialogue. Instead, I think people are expressing you know, opinions in real time that clearly are not fully considered. Uh, they're very superficially expressed and very, very dangerous, uh, so, particularly uh, targeting minorities across the whole the whole piece. And I, I think it's absolutely healthy, as I think we both would agree to have different viewpoints 
healthy for democracy, healthy for, you know, within a higher education setting like Bradford, absolutely to encourage that debate, that discourse, that dialogue. But I think it's essential for people with those different viewpoints to come together constructively mm. and have meaningful engagement, sharing ideas, uh, seeking out new strands of evidence, analyzing uh, different lived lived experiences. So, you know, I think it's a combination of both economic and strategies at the moment, really, really potent. Mm, yeah, definitely. And that kind of, that's a really nice way. I'm just, I'm, I'm just looking at some of the questions um, we've got here to look at now, actually. And, and what you were saying there about, you know, having people with different viewpoints, different life experiences around the table is, is, is super, super important. It's something I always touch on myself about the idea that we, we really need to understand all the different points of view before we really we know a situation you know and it's something i do deeply as as, as an anthropologist as well um so the first question that i i'm gonna um ask here is, is, has been posed by by kathy and um, so I hope you're 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 okay answering this because we've talked about your political career. We've 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 talked about um, the the different um, areas that you've worked in, and um, it's kind of very delicately. We didn't really speak about the 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 political party within which you were situated, but I think this is actually a really yeah. important yeah. question here from Kathy. Um, and they're asking that that many people might might see the Conservatives as an, an obvious choice for a gay working class man. So where were there ever tensions between your politics and your LGBT um, identity um, with, within that particular political party? Oh, absolutely, yes. And I've, I've got, uh, you know, distinct memories from uh, the late 80s when I was protesting on the streets against Clause 26 morphed into Section 28 of the Local Government Act, which prohibited the teaching of homosexual relationships as, in quotes, pretended family relationships. So absolutely, there was there was tension. In fact, I mentioned uh, as I did in my teeth, but I, I, I took a, a step back during those those that particular period. Um, and, and wasn't a member of the party for, for quite a number of years, actually, during that, that, that time growing up. I think clearly, you know, both parties of, of the centre left and centre right, you know, together have, have absolutely correctly sought to advance the equalities and inclusion agenda. I was, I was recently the equalities minister and a number from Labour. It was almost a sort of, um, almost like a sort of inflationary which party, you know, introduced uh, same sex, equal marriage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think if you look at the, the evolution of, of equality in our democracy, I think, you know, probably both of the mainstream parties have had quite a hand, quite a positive hand in that. I'll never be complacent, you know, um, and, and whether it's uh, from an LGBTQ perspective, or whether it's from, from, from other other minority perspectives, and we saw it under Corbyn in Labour uh, with the, the whole sort of anti-Semitic, uh, arguably under, you know, never be complacent. And I think I'd rather be in the tent, influencing mm -hmm. from within inside, rather than shouting from, from the outside. But again, that, that, that's my preferred approach, and um, mm -hmm. that, that very much is, is, is what I do. Uh, and seeking to influence the debate and the temperature, trying to set the temperature through that as well. Yeah, and I think it, it, it also, you know, it's it's the, the something that I've come to admit myself as I've got older as well, um, you know, in, in terms of always trying to listen to different points of view and trying to really understand where the you know, very opposite ideas about about life and society to my own come from is that that also when we ask these questions, you know, particularly about you know what 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 is a gay you know what what is a gay person doing in the Conservative Party and so forth that sexuality is not a, is not our whole person. It's it, it's a facet of our identity. Um, you know, in 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 the personal way. Um, so it it's 
yeah, when we when we start to see that it's just one piece of our human jigsaw and personality, we can we can kind of think about that uh, a little bit more. And I'm kind of, you know, I'm I'm from a very, very different um, politicised background to yourself, but I also very much, you know, in, in terms of, of, of the role that I have in university as well, I, I very much see the benefit of of, of being in the room as well. Um, I have a, a friend who has a very similar approach as well, who's got a very quite a high influential position um, within the domestic violence arena as well, um, working for different agencies there. And they are a trans masculine non-binary person that works in environments that can be very hostile to them within domestic violence. But they've always taught me that they prefer to be in the room having those conversations, I think, as well. Um, so, yeah, thanks for answering that question. So we've got another ooh, we've got another uh, a question here from from somebody who who's on the I Ivory Coast. Um, zooming in from there, uh, it'd be nice to know what the weather's like. <laughs> typically British fashion and they're asking um, uh, uh, this person's asking a question about social inclusion in schools and universities about how we encourage social inclusion in societies where injustice towards a minority is 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 emerging and becoming greater so in countries such as um, well I'd say in 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 some in some countries in in the continent of, of Africa um what kind of policies and communities do communities need to adopt to apply social inclusion so I suppose that this is about us thinking of of a global view you know where you historically um predominantly thanks to colonialism you have a lot of countries um where you know, excluded and minoritised groups are, are treated incredibly poorly, yet we do have this almost global industry of EDI coming around now and, and the recognition within, you know, the politics of those countries that it's an important thing. And a lot of this comes from, you know, relationships, economic relationships, international development and so forth, and, and how that kind of dialogue comes into different countries. But yeah, I suppose they're asking about how, how do you begin to encourage social inclusion in an environment where there is a lot of injustice. Have you have you got an, anything to say around that? I mean, I, I think what I would say is simply to express this is a really complex issue and I think context is is key. The, 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 the political, social, historiographical context of different cultures, different nations, different different you know, systems within 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 countries. Um, I mean, I think it's also going back to your reference to c colonial legacy. Just being clear here that, that there's 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 no monopoly on um, doing the right things. There's no there's no monopoly. I don't think it's I don't think EDI is is, is necessarily a Western a Western led construct. Um, a lot of it does stem from corporates mind. So we need to look at it through that lens. That's probably a separate conversation. But you know, I'm I'm sure there's a yeah, a huge amount to for us to learn as Western Western is sitting here in the UK at the moment from from nations around around the world. Um, I was recently um, watching a, a film about the impact of an African based charity that seeks to um, protect orphans in North Ghana called AfriKids. Now it's a UK based charity, but the, the, the purpose of that charity is for the solutions to be locally led locally developed and, and co-owned uh, on the ground rather than, than foisted on 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 them from from UK Western Western uh, culture. So again, you know, I, I'd say to um, anyone seeking to understand social mobility and inclusion, you know, look at it from your own your own uh, country and your own your own culture's history background first and foremost. And, you know, there, there may well be things that are going on locally where you're living, where you're watching from today, that perhaps uh, are in some regards more advanced than than in parts mm. of the UK. We mentioned some of the economic uh, potential backward steps that are going that, that seems to be happening here in Britain at the moment. Yeah, I think I think definitely I think this is why that, you know, that is such a complex you know, it's a very academic thing to say, but it's such a complex subject to approach because being able to unravel and undo any kind of, you know, what is pre-colonial, what is post-colonial, what 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 it, what is around, 
um, you know, indigenous thought patterns. It's 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 yeah, I think my own my own career and, and research in, in international development and in and, and around global health and sexual and reproductive health in Latin America is is a is a hundred percent always, you know, is starting from your base of what you and your community needs most definitely and using language as well that's appropriate for that understanding. Um, so I'm going to move to another question now, which I, I love this question. I wish I'd have come up with it myself. Um, this is from um, an, an, an anonymous um, um, person, but they um, they're asking that as someone who has held a prominent political position as an openly gay man, how far away do you think we are from having an openly gay prime minister? And what additional challenges do you think they might face in running for office? Great question. Very or uh, race uh, crashingly unfolding at the moment, uh, blue on blue, as they say. Um, and again, you know, I, I, I think we we possibly have uh, prime ministers. Um, Ted Heath comes to mind who have not been married and, and possibly have been in the closet. But, so we would not necessarily be a first first thing. I think. Partly it's to do with um, the network, the support network that one one has as well. I mean, I was very fortunate being a prominent member of my community in Westminster, uh, and I'm not one moment paralleling being the prime, being the Lord Mayor with Prime Minister, but just just drawing out some some lessons there. I th I think it's really um, it, the, the the role of Prime Minister is is you know, your 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 heads on the block really for. For running the, the running the country, I'm not I'm not sure um, quite how it would necessarily impact fully on uh, as in a huge amount on the role. I think going back to what Jack was saying earlier, there's, there's multi, you're a multi dimension multi dimension person. I mean, um, just as we had first and second uh, female prime ministers in this country, I hope one day we do get out. Um, LGBTQ PM. I think that will be, you know, fascinating. It would certainly set set the temperature in the sort of House of Commons. Um, but I think, uh, it, and I think it would resonate more widely than, than only sexual orientation identity. I could see that actually embracing and being more emblematic or wider kind of EDI EDI strand to government. Looking back, you know, both under Blair and under Cameron and a little uh, Theresa May as well. Yeah, we, we have seen advances in terms of public policy around this this topic. So you know, there are obviously straight um, affect policy in this area. But I would hope that that with a uh, national leader, that that things that, that, that the stride would would be even more confident and, and quicker, if you like. Yeah, I think I think I would say it's a that's a it's a lovely optimistic <laughs> answer there. And I I think when I think about that question, you know, I think I think definitely it doesn't necessarily impact on on the the, the job that the person's doing. And I, I I think the issue that where we're still at as a society is 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 the is the mudslinging and the the muck raking that happens when somebody wants to get into. Um, such a position of, of power and responsibility. I think for me, you know, that that would definitely be the biggest challenge. You know, I, I cannot even, unfortunately, you know, begin to imagine, you know, when when we might entertain um, the first openly queer and, and trans leader, um, you know, of a political party in that position, because I don't know how strong that person would have to be um you know um to put themselves in danger in that in that way to be to you know the, the type of things that um you know would it would be said to them i think anybody going into any kind of um that level of position there's there's definitely something special about them in their ability <laughs> i don't know to be able to have some form of teflon around them I can't imagine what it's like to be just bombarded with with horrendous things on a daily basis. Um, I kind of know that a little bit as a trans. I think Jack, minute, but, not, but but yeah, not in that position of power. So, and I, I think 
speaking of power, I think the notion of soft power might come into this as well. So just just to kind of come back to the question, not through that prime minister, but I, I do personally know of ambassadors re representing the UK stationed abroad. So these are senior international diplomats, you know, or, or, or in quotes, or man in, in whichever country, or, or, or woman in whichever country, if you like, you know, they, they will often be stationed abroad with their same sex partner uh, in countries where same sex relationships are not recognised in the way that we recognise them, particularly in terms of, of equal marriage, for example. But uh, you know, the Foreign Office have a way of, of accommodating the same sex partner through the creation of a junior attaché role so they can both live together at the residence, be, be represented at the embassy as, a, as a, a couple, if you like. And I think that kind of soft power to me, I think there's something quite important that if you're in a, a senior position of authority and the accountability that comes with that, that you, you do get to exercise that influence as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so I think that's just about the end of time that we have for questions. We've already, um, sorry, sorry, um, Philip, sorry, Holly, I know that we've already overrun um, a little bit. Um, and thanks to everyone who submitted a question. And, and I apologise if we were unable to, to getting around to answering yours. Um, but I think I hope we'll all agree that it's been a really fascinating and informative conversation. I, I could be here all afternoon. You've, there's so many things that I want to ask you and life advice that I need from you, Ian, as well. So I <laughs> just, um, we could definitely do this again. And I think the things um, that, that I most definitely uh, would take away from today um, are really, you know, the comfort in knowing, you know, even as myself as, a, as an adult in my 40s, that, 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 that there's still more things that I can do and achieve in life. And there's, there's many different paths that I can still take. And that, um, just the the reminder as well of 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 where you know a, 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 what essentially is a is a few months or a couple of years spent in an education institution um and and gaining you know not a qualification but gaining an education of what that can do and where that can lead you to and that also makes me think you know at a time in the year where I'm I'm very busy and, and getting to a point where I'm I might be questioning my career choices again because higher education as we get to the summer we're all incredibly tired having done that year and, and asking ourselves the question why am I here <laughs> what am I doing you've reminded me of, of 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 what I can contribute to people's lives as an academic as well Ian so so I thank you for that because we quite often forget you know what happens in the classroom and where people um, go on to afterwards so so that's great so um what um i'd just like to before i pass back over to philip um ian would you like to give any closing remarks is there anything else that you would you you'd like to say this afternoon i think you've just popped off my screen are you still there no, Ian's, Ian's disappeared. I've scared him away with that last comment. <laughs> I do apologise. So I think maybe i um, pass over to, to Philip while um, hopefully Ian will be trying to reconnect. Oh, he's, he's yes, he's coming in. Ian, you're back to us. <laughs> you're just on mute. I don't know, there we go, back again. I've, I've got a new background as well, but I have no idea, Jack, what happened. Forgive me, I think we had a, a gremlin. We did, somebody, uh, somebody crept in. <laughs> so apologies, I don't know. That's yes. fine. I just while, while you're with us, I just wanted to say if there is I'm loving the background, by the way, because because pride pride is throughout the year for, for everything. It's um, I'm in Hebden Bridge at the minute and it's our, our pride week at the minute. So I'm feeling very rainbowy um, at the moment. Um, I, is there anything um, <laughs> you, you'd, you'd like to say to have the, 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 the kind of final words before we pass on to Philip? Yeah, that's kind of I mean, really just to you know, iterate my thanks at the start of our conversation together. I really enjoyed it, Jack, actually. Really rich conversation together. And thanks to you and Philip and others who put uh, you know, a lot of prep and work behind the scenes as well and enabling you know me to have a platform uh, on your 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 channel today. And you know, just the key thing is, um, you know, I guess the, 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 the pride 
and the longevity of my connection with Bradford. You know, I, I really mean that. It was a real kind of, in a positive sense, a real fork in the road uh, when I when I uh, gained my MBA from you. So I uh, really, really just want to say thank you for that. Great, thanks. So I'm going to pass over to, to Philip now. You're still there. <laughs> Yes, uh, th thank you, Jack, and thank you, Ian, as well, um, for that insightful conversation. Sitting in the background, um, sorting out all the questions and answers, I hope that everybody in the audience found the conversation as informative and enlightening as I did, just being able to, to work behind the scenes on this event. Um, now, thank you to everyone for attending, and we look forward to welcoming you back to another one of the events organised by the University of Bradford alumni team very soon. Although we don't have any scheduled in the calendar at the moment, we have plans for a very busy schedule throughout the next academic year, both of our both of further Meet the Alumni events and of our Bradford Alumni Speaker Series events as well. So please keep an eye on our social media channels and our email newsletters for details of those upcoming future events. Um, so once again, just to end uh, this event, I'd like to um, extend my very warm thanks again to Ian and to Jack for volunteering to host this event and we look forward to welcoming you our audience back to an event in the very near future. Thank you.